you know, keep going on our little foray through the animal phyla, the representative animal phyla, that, that show some of the major evolutionary developments. And we're now up to uh, mollusca, the phylum mollusca, which is essentially things like clams, uh, and related things, oysters, those are also sort of like clams. Um, octopods, which is the plural of octopus, octopods uh, and squids. Squids are also uh, in this category. Uh, I should also, uh, yeah, I guess that's good enough. So there's also the gastropods, which like the snails and things, but we'll we'll get to that in a, in a minute. So what does this phylum have? We're, it's kind of hard to draw a picture now because there's so many different variations, right? A, a sponge, there's one picture for all the sponges, but these phyla have a lot more diversity. So, you know, drawing a picture of a particular one, it's going to be slightly different for the other. There are so many like an octopus picture, is going to be very different from a clam or an oyster picture. So we won't worry about that. But, of course, we do see extensive specialization. That's kind of a theme now. And so along with that, we get the full, complete three germ layers. Right? Remember, that's the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm derm layers, all three. And we see uh, a little more complex organ development. Um, so they have everything that we saw in Platyhelminthes and Annelida, but uh, almost like a greater degree. So basically, we have a greater degree of specialization and more organs and systems being developed. Right? So let's put more complex organs and systems. And then what that means then is the more complex you get, the more you can adapt to different environments. And so therefore, the more diverse the phylum becomes. So as I was just saying, uh, for the sponges, they all kind of look the same and have the very same body plan. But with the mollusks, we have all the different body plans of different types of animals that are very different looking because they've exploited different environments, right? But they still all share these similar characteristics, which is why they're still in the same phylum. Remember, too, that the phylum level is not a very um, detailed level of taxonomy. It's a, a phylum contains thousands and thousands of different animals, right? So, well, maybe not thousands, but... Oh, yeah, I would say if you're talking about species, it could be thousands and thousands of different species within a phyla. So it's just a general overall sort of group. Um, the other thing that we mentioned is that they have an open circulatory system. So that means that circulatory system, which means that there are... Uh, so what, let me see if I can draw that. If you If you... If you have a, a body of some sort, right, then what happens is there are rudimentary blood vessels throughout the body, sort of, right, and they might be connected to a primitive kind of heart or pumping mechanism. Um, but what happens is the blood tends to uh, just go through these major blood vessels which direct the blood to certain parts of the body, but then the blood just spills out and floods an entire area and bathes all the cells and organs that are there, right? And then it'll slowly work its way back into what we might call this vein here, right? It slowly work its way back in and then cycle back through. So there is a, there is a cycling, but it's not quite the same as a heart pumping blood through blood vessels. The cycling would be much slower and less efficient right, because the blood is just mixing all around. And so as the blood is absorbing waste products and delivering nutrients, it slowly gets recycled or moved around and refreshed, right? Most of these animals would have some kind of gill structure to give them oxygen. Most of them are aquatic. Some snails are not aquatic. Um, they live uh, 
on land, terrestrial uh, snails and things. But most of the mollusks, the mollusks are um, are uh, definitely aquatic. Clams, oysters, octopods, all of these things are aquatic creatures. So the gastropods, the snails, they're a slightly different group, uh, very similar, but not quite the same. Okay. Um, open circulatory system. And the other interesting thing about them is uh, they have shells. Many of them have developed shells as a kind of specialized, now that's a specialization, right? That's a cell, uh, an ectoderm cell that has learned or developed the ability to produce a shell. And the shells are made of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is commonly called chalk. And in fact, um, although we can now isolate calcium carbonate in different ways, originally calcium carbonate, as, as animals in the ocean would live and die, a lot of these dead bodies would pile up on the bottom, right? You with me? They would pile up on the bottom and produce layers of, of shells, which would then sort of become calcium carbonate rock deposits. Calcium carb it's a soft, soft chalk. It's a, it'd be basically, you could go down and, and dig up the, the ground and you'd get chalk from it. And you can use this to make actual chalk from a chalkboard that writes. Because the calcium carbonate molecule forms an, an interesting chemical structure, it's, it's very slippery. It slides around on itself. The molecules slide and they produce the ability to easily mark and write things, certain things. Anyway, that's kind of an interesting thing about these guys. So this is kind of like just a continuation of what we saw in the annelids and the platyhelminthes, but just a little bit more. Okay. We'll also talk about another group that is sort of interesting, echinodermata. Dermata. These are the um, uh, spiny... Skin, that's what the word means. It means spiny skin. Uh, but it's like starfish. Starfish. Um, urchins. There's a thing called a sea cucumber. Those kinds of things. Or a sand dollar. You might have heard about a sand dollar. Uh, maybe what I can do, we, we've seen the pictures of mollusks. Maybe I can show you a couple of pictures of, um, of echinoderms. Yeah, see, this is the... Um, this is showing all, all clams here, are all uh, snails. This was for mollusca. I wonder if I put octopus in here. Just to kind of have a picture. Well, there's not very many good pictures. Here's one, sort of. Um, basically, we're just getting pictures of octopods, which is... Okay, so we won't worry about that. But let's talk about... Let's see if we can get uh, uh, images of um, the echinoderms, just so you can see what they are. Uh, and here they are, this typical starfish. This is a sand dollar, this little guy over here on the bottom right of this picture, sand dollar. Uh, this is a kind of sea urchin. You can see they all have sort of spiny, spiny skins, right? And uh, that's basically the, the, uh, one of the factors that isolates them from others. That's the name of their phylum. Um, if, we, if we consider the echinoderms, again, they have pretty much the same sort of um, three germ layer uh, symmetry. Some of them have radial symmetry, though, which is interesting. So sometimes we see radial symmetry here as opposed to the bilateral symmetry. So there is a slight difference there. Um, like the starfish, for instance, right? Radial symmetry. But there are also others in this that are bilateral. So both both types of symmetry we find here, like in a sea cucumber or something, it's bilateral, but in a starfish, it's more radial. 
what's interesting about this, and the reason why I include it, is because um, we've been studying them in detail, and they often have a larval stage. Remember, the, the idea of a larva is interesting, right? The humans don't really have a larva stage as such. Um, we kind of do. You, you could kind of consider our embryonic development as sort of being like a larva, but that's not really true because a larval stage is a stage where you live, eat and breathe and, and, and exist in that stage. You're not just tucked away in the womb of something developing. See, we've sort of given up the larval stage and replaced it with a completely internal embryonic development. But in many animals, the egg cells develop into first a larval stage, which is often some kind of little wormy-like creature. And it lives, it, it swims or it moves and it, it eats like a caterpillar, for instance, right? It's, it's not in the womb, it's out and about in the world. And it's a butterfly, but it's, it looks like a worm because it's in a larval stage. Um, the same is true for many of these echinoderms. They have larval stages. And so before they grow into a starfish, they exist as a little larva, wormy thing swimming around. And um, the larval stage of these uh, has, um, has many similarities if we study it. many similarities uh, with vertebrates. And so it makes us wonder if there's a link, possible link in our extreme ancestry. A possible link. Um, like maybe, maybe we're actually more closely related to starfish than we are to octopods or something like that. Uh, we're, we're not completely definitive on that. We're, a lot of these things are being studied and we're trying to fill in the, the family tree of life, but you know, we keep, we keep changing our mind on which branches are connected to what and where. But uh, that's what's interesting about the echinoderms. There's some new research that we've been able to do that suggests that we might be more closely related to these starfish and sand dollars and things than we think we were in the past. So that's kind of interesting. But I'm just going to put here um, in red uh, a continuation, right? Continue, which basically is going to mean all the same stuff as before instead of writing it out every time. Three germ layers, right? These have... Now, um, it, it's a continuation, but, but in some ways it's not. The organ structure of these things is less developed than in the annelids or in the mollusks. Um, the the uh, the symmetry is a little bit different, but there is a gut, right? And there are muscles. There are three germ layers. So this is kind of um, uh, not so much a moving forward phylum, but an interesting phylum that has a sort of a link, possibly to vertebrate taxonomy and and evolution. So that's why I included it there. It's kind of interesting. Okay. Now we get into a really exciting one. I like this one. It's one of my favorites. It's a very old phylum. It's been around. Uh, it's probably one of the oldest land animal phylums, and it's arthropoda. Arthropods. Remember I said arthropoda means jointed legs? Jointed legs. And, of course, this refers to, I mean, we have jointed legs too, but... This refers to things with legs that have several different joints, and uh, typically it is in insects and uh, other things like that. It's probably one of those people telling me that my uh, credit, my my, I have a criminal record, and I'm going to be sued for millions of dollars unless I call and give them my all my money in a what do they call it a gift card or something. So jointed legs. And um, insects are one of the biggest groups, but it also includes uh, arachnids, like the spiders and things, uh, scorpions and things like that, but also lobsters, crayfish, they all have uh, very close ties to insects. 
crayfish, etc. So actually, what we can do is we can look at um, the three subphyla. So there are three subphyla to further delineate this. Um, there is telicerata, the chelicerates, telicerata, and that's your uh, basically. There, there are three classes here. Three classes, and that includes the spiders. Uh, that's where spiders are found. They are chelicerates. Crustacea. You must have heard the word crustacean before. Well, that's the uh, six classes, six different classes in there, but that includes... Uh, lobsters, fish, shrimp. Some of these are deliciously tasty. Shrimp, lobster, crayfish, crabs. Crayfish. All of those types of animals, right? Uh, also, interestingly enough, some but things that look more like insects but are more closely related to the lobsters and the, the crayfish and crabs. Things like sow bugs. Have you ever seen, a, I'm sure you've seen a sow bug, um, water flea. I'll show you what a sow bug looks like because whenever you turn over a rotten log or a stone, you usually find sow bugs. Uh, images. These little guys. And they're creepy crawly and they... They crawl all over the place under rocks and things. I'm sure you've seen them. Well, if you look at their body plan, they kind of look like a bug. The first thing we think of, an insect, but they're not an insect. First of all, they don't have six legs. They have several different legs, if you look at that. Uh, so we call them a bug, but they're not really a bug. And what we find is if we look at their genetics and some of their, uh, some of their uh, body, body organization and so on, then if you look at these ones, they look... Very much like a lobster. They're kind of lobsterish. You see how they have that scaly sort of um, armor-like shell that's kind of plated like a lobster tail and so on? So they have some characteristics that make us believe that they're more closely related to lobsters. So we find those in this other phyla. And then the last phyla is the one, it's called Uniramia. And that is, um, it's, got, it's got two, two superclasses. We're not going to worry about that, but I'm just writing it down for interest. Two superclasses. One of them is uh, the my, Myriapoda. What does a myriad mean? If there's a myriad of options, it's a word that basically means a lot, a very lot. So myriapoda means a lot of feet. What has a lot of feet? Centipedes and millipedes, right? So that's the centipedes and millipedes. Right. And then the other superclass, oh, I kind of ran out of room there to put it on the other side, so I'll just... Uh, the other superclass I'll put underneath here in red is uh, Insecta. Insecta, let's spell it right. And it includes all the insects. And there are so many insects. Insecta. So many insects. And so, uh, I don't know about you, but when I was in elementary school, I remember doing a unit on classification of living things or something like that. I don't know if they still do that. And we talked about, you know, how we identify an insect because it has six legs. Right? Uh, all insects also have wings at some point in their life cycle or um, some members of their species have wings. Like ants don't seem to have wings, but queen ants do. And so wings and flying seems to be an important part of the insect life. They also have three body parts, right? The head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Do, you, do those words mean anything? Did you learn that in grade four or five or something? The three body part plan, right? And, and we have that too. We have a head, 
Our thorax is our chest area where our heart and lungs are. And then our abdomen is our abdominal cavity down just below. But we're a little bit different in organization because our limbs attach differently. In the insects, all the limbs attach to the thorax, so like our arms. But our legs are kind of weird. They're in the wrong spot for an insect body plan. Insects also have antenna, which are interesting structures for smelling, basically, and detecting chemical. They detect chemicals. That's the main purpose of antenna. Um, I don't think they get very many radio stations, but they do detect chemicals on the air. All right, so what is it? Let's just do some general characteristics of this phyla. They have a very hard exoskeleton. which means they're bones. They don't have bones. They have a hard outer shell. It's like living inside a suit of armor. It's made of um, <clears throat> chitin. Sorry. It's made of chitin. Now remember who else had chitin way back? Yeah, the fungi. So uh, it's possible, but there's an evolutionary link between fungi and eventually somewhere along the line a line through the tree of branches that would end up with insects because they do share this interesting thing of chitin. Uh, and we don't see that very in very many other places, right? Uh, so they make this chitin, which is basically like a polysaccharide. It's a kind of starchy sugar molecule. It's made by, it's a polymer of many different little, little um, sugar molecules. Now the exoskeleton is a very unique thing. We don't see it. Um, in very many other creatures. So the idea of skeleton is interesting because so what happens for humans is in order for muscles to work, uh, they, well, they can do very simple things. Like some muscles don't require any attachment. So think about your tongue. It's attached at the back, but most of the tongue, it moves and wiggles and writhes in various ways to allow us to talk. And it's, it's a very important muscle for humans. And if you think about the planarian worm, it's just a big muscle that undulates and wiggles and moves, kind of like a tongue, right? It, it sort of has the same kind of movements that your tongue can do. But in order for you to do more uh, vigorous things, like for instance, to use your body to lift something, to push something, and to maneuver things, we need to have a way to brace the muscles. The muscles need to be able to have something they can push against and, and pull against, right? So our muscles use our, our bones. Bones developed, uh, initially, bones developed as a, as a calcium source for animals that were uh, not living in the ocean any longer where calcium was plentiful. They were moving inland and uh, they were moving up into freshwater rivers and things and eventually evolution saw fit to pick those that could store calcium in their bodies over those who couldn't. So our bones began as calcium storage, but because you have this lump of calcium, it's also a secondary purpose would be to attach a muscle to it and use it to push and pull as a brace. So our muscles inside are all attached by tendons to our muscles. So when we lift, and we always have muscles in twos. I don't know if you know that. Our muscles always work in twos. So in your arm, for instance, let me draw a picture while I'm talking about this. In your arm, uh, there's a pair of muscles. So here's your uh, shoulder, right? Your shoulder bone goes down like this. And then you have the elbow here. And from the elbow, there are actually two little bones that come out, the radius and the ulna. And then they meet your wrist. Right, and your hand is here, hand bones. So when we're looking at muscles, we have a large muscle here on top called the bicep muscle, right? That's when you pump yourself up, all these weightlifters want big biceps. And it's attached down here, just on this side of the forearm. So when, when this muscle squeezes, it shortens, it pulls. It pulls upward this way when it squeezes, which pulls on the tendon, which lifts the hand up, lifts the arm up. That's how we do it, right? But it needs to pull on the bone to do that. It needs to be attached to the bone. And then on the other side, there's a smaller muscle. It's smaller because this action doesn't, isn't as useful to us. The bicep is important for lifting. Humans do a lot of lifting things, carrying things. But there's also a muscle that pushes the arm out the other way. 
This muscle is attached also to a tendon that wraps around the joint and attaches to the other side of the forearm. And so when it contracts, it pulls this way, which then causes the hand to go down. So the two muscles work in conjunction with each other, both attached to the bone, to produce a hand that can move up and down for lifting. Right? We use our tricep muscles when we want to extend our arms, so for pushing things. Right? When you push things, you use your triceps. If you want to exercise your triceps, a good exercise is a push-up, because you're pushing, it's the, the extending of the arms. But that's for an internal skeleton. Um, with, with the arthropods, their skeleton is all on the outside. So if this is the thorax shell, right? So when their legs attach, like a lobster, there's a little spot here, and the jointed lobster legs sort of come out like this, right? And inside there are muscles, but the muscles don't attach to any bones. Instead, the muscles are attached to or push against the exoskeleton. And so they use the exoskeleton as their brace. And so the inside of these arthropods is all mushy. It's all muscle and tissue, and there's no bone in there. There's nothing really solid. But it uses the outside as its sort of pushing leverage. And the muscles are all attached to different points and positions on the exoskeleton. So it's like they're a blob of goo living inside a suit of armor. But by pushing in certain ways on the armor, they can cause the armor to move, right? So the, the exoskeleton is quite unique quite unique. And it looks like a suit of armor, especially like with lobsters, you can see the different plates and how they have to be plated and overlapped in order to get the movement, just like the arm of a suit of armor has like plates in order to get the joints to move. It's a pretty complex evolutionary thing to get jointed armor, jointed suits of armor. It took us a long time to figure it out. Our original armor was just massive plates. And wherever we had a joint, we just had a cloth or something. But then we learned how to overlay the plates and how to how the how the how them slide on each other so we could make joints in armor to cover up those vulnerable parts, right? So the exoskeleton made of chitin is a very important characteristic of this particular group. Uh, let's see. This makes them it makes them waterproof, highly adaptable, and highly mobile. Right? They don't have bones. But they have the exoskeleton, which means their muscles can do a hell of a lot more, much more than an arth uh, than a, um, a, a snail, a gastropod, or a mollusk, or a, uh, a flatworm, or a, an earthworm. They're, these muscles can do all kinds of intricate things. And of course, guess what? We also see limbs. We never saw limbs before, because limbs are pretty much dependent on a skeleton of some kind in order to work. So limbs hands and feet and appendages that can be moved and do things makes you a far more impressive animal and far more diverse because you can do so many things with limbs in your environment. Um, you can also use your exoskeleton to have for, for mating, mating displays. So different bugs have different structures like horn-like shapes that come out of their their uh, exoskeleton or so on, and they use them as, as in mating rituals as ways to attract mates and things like that. All right, what else have we got here? Uh, one of the drawbacks of having an exoskeleton is growth is difficult. See, for us, we grow, and because our soft parts are on the outside, they just grow outward, and our bones inside can grow. But if you have a, a suit of armor on and you grow, pretty soon you're going to outgrow your armor because the armor itself can't grow. So we have this interesting situation where uh, these arthropods get too big for their armor as they grow, and so they have to shed their skin. So they shed, or the shedding of the exoskeleton is a very important development that happens every time they grow. And you can sometimes see the empty carcasses or the empty shells, especially what I find a lot are crayfish. If you go to the water, you live near your camp or whatever, you go down to the water, you'll find crayfish, but they're just empty crayfish shells, right? And you think, oh, that's a dead crayfish. No, it's not. It's a crayfish who basically got rid of his shell. They basically crack out of it. They, they grow a softer shell underneath. 
and they crack out of the old one, break out and leave it behind, and then the soft one they've developed very quickly hardens and turns into a hard shell again. It means they're quite vulnerable, though, to predators during that time because their skeleton is quite soft. Um, we have highly specialized here. I'm going to put highly specialized now cells. Very specialized. And of course, these things have been evolving for millions and millions of years, right? Uh, insects came on the, uh, the back in the, was it the Devonian, I think, back in the late Devonian or the, um, the Silurian. I think if you go way back to those ages, which are far back on the chart, you'll see that the first insects were already starting. So highly specialized. Um, they have segmentation, just like the annelids. So you can see how they're kind of a progression. They're segmented, but they have only three, three segments. The head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Okay? Da, 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 da. And, or sometimes, I should point out, sometimes it's only two segments, like spiders. They have, they have what's called a cephalothorax, which is like a head and a thorax together. Cephalothorax and an abdomen. But that's, that's a small point. It's not, it's not a major one. But two or three segments anyway. Um, now, what's interesting about these segments is they have very specialized roles. So the head. Let's talk about why we have the importance of the head. It has antenna. Uh, Maybe I should spell that right. Antenna. These are interesting structure that we see in this group. Uh, and those, of course, are chemical detectors. So sense organs, right? The other thing the head has is it has um, a compound eyes. The eyes are usually compound eyes. Uh, what a compound eye is, is instead of our eye, which has one lens and the light is focused through on a retina, they have basically an eye that has many lenses. So it's almost like having one eye made of like 500 little eyes. And when you look at an insect eye up close, that's why it has that weird sheen because of the way it reflects the light. So it's, it's an it's a interesting eye. We don't know exactly what it would be like to look through these eyes because we can't get into the tiny uh, ganglion brain of an insect. But we can speculate that it might look something like a kaleidoscope when you look in a kaleidoscope. So instead of looking at you and seeing one image of you, it's possible that there's sort of like a kaleidoscope of images of you in the brain. And I don't know if you've ever looked in a kaleidoscope, but what we think is that this compound eye would be very, very good at sensing movement. Because think about it, if I'm looking at you and you wiggle your finger, that's one little image wiggling. But if you have a compound eye and it's a kaleidoscope of images of you and they all wiggle their finger at the same time, it's a much, much greater impact, isn't it? Think about what it's like when you go to um, the, uh, a store that sells televisions and they have all the TVs on, on the same channel, on the wall. Have you ever seen that? It's kind of like, whoa, and you, and you can see everything, and it really stands out. Like, whatever happens on a screen, even if it's a small movement, it's big now because it's been, it's been increased by many different, um, many different pictures. So it's possible that that's what compound dyes might, might look like in the brain, which means that insects would be very good at detecting any kind of movement. The slightest movement would be like a huge visual stimulus for them. Think about when you swat a fly. You try. You get up very close. You try to move very slowly. But even those slow movements are very sensitive to the fly. If compound eyes would pick up the slightest movement. So often when you go to slap it, it flies away and reacts before you get a chance. So the compound eyes are probably highly sensitive to movement. And so they're very successful because a bug essentially wants to know two things. It wants to know how to get away from something, right? That might be a predator, or it wants to know how to find something that might be prey. And movement is a good indicator of those things. So that's a cool thing, the compound eye. Uh, 
like for instance, I just have noted here in my notes, uh, uh, Dragonfly has about 28,000 different optical units in its eye. 28,000 individual eyes, all sort of working together as one big compound eye. Um, right? Now, the trade-off, though, is that the human eye, it has one lens and one image. But just to give you an idea, that image is formed by over 6 million cone cells, or rod cells in our in our eye. So our visual acuity is probably better. The image that these eyes give would be grainy, right? If, if you, I recall the days back when we used to watch television and the image that we got on the TV because it came over the antenna was often very grainy. Now we have such high resolution that, you know, it, it's so, so high now that, that, that people who are on television they have to work extra hard to hide all their little blemishes with makeup because everything shows. And then I remember watching the progression. If you watch an old sitcom from way back, the image looks much, much blurrier. It's not as clear. And that's kind of the, the, the trade-off for the human eye is we don't have this extremely high sensitivity to motion, but we have an extremely clear image that gives us more detail about what we're looking at. And that's our evolutionary advantage. Uh, they have a, a brain. I'm going to put this in, in brackets. By brain, what we essentially mean is it has a, a centralized ganglion. Uh, remember I told you about the ganglia? Well, we start to see in insects that the ganglion that's in the head seems to be a little more in control. It's kind of like the head ganglion. <laughs> It's in the head, but it's also like the chief ganglion, right? And it seems to be taking over more control, especially regulating the sensory inputs coming from all the different parts of the head. Okay. Um, but again, it's primitive, and so obviously it can't process. It, a lot of our brain is used for our vision. The entire back lobe of our brain is for vision. So their vision is probably very grainy, very primitive in terms of its um, definition, but Pretty damn good at sensing movement. Okay, uh, let's go to the thorax, which is the next body part. We're almost done here, and then we'll take a break, so just hang on with me. The thorax, uh, basically, this is where the legs all attach. Well, the other interesting thing about the head is the mouth. Insects have a mouth that have complex mouth parts. So it's like they have little arms that stick out around their mouth, little... Their mouths all have wiggly finger-like projections, and they use these to gather and collect food. They don't need to grip to pick up food with their leg, because they have, if you ever see pictures of bugs, they got weird mouth parts. Some of them have developed into sharp, pinching mandibles, like with ants that they can grab with. Things like lobsters have more like a whole bunch of little things and they can pull in food. So their mouth has its own little set of appendages, which is weird. It's kind of alien-like, right? But the legs, for locomotion, those are centered on the thorax. Uh, it also bears the wings. That's where the wings attach for flying. And that's another thing about the insects we mentioned. Uh, they were the first to exploit the air. They were way before birds. They figured out how to have wings and how to uh, use the air and fly. Uh, I guess that's good enough. And then the abdomen, just to finish up fairly quickly on this. Uh, the abdomen is where all the soft organs are. And there are substantial developments of organs um, in this particular group. They often have poisons, toxic glands that secrete poisons and things. And if you think about it, evolutionarily speaking, if you think about like a reptile, like the snake, it also sheds its skin, which is interesting. And it contains poison glands. So it makes you wonder about the evolutionary process, right? Now, insects kind of took a whole little tree off to them on their own way back when. So it's not likely that a snake is very closely related to an insect. But it's interesting that they share the same traits. Those are called uh, kind of like a parallel thing where like the wings of a bird didn't evolve out of the wings of insects. They're completely different structures. But they both evolved wings in a different way to exploit the same environment, right? Okay, and so just to finish up uh, very quickly, some interesting facts here. Um, the nervous system is more advanced than in the annelids. 
the worms. Uh, some of the ganglia I can fuse together. Oops, more advanced. So they have the fused ganglia, and um, they have a double nerve cord. So bigger ganglia, they have the centralized ganglia, uh, and so on. So just, uh, you know, basically more advanced nervous system. Open circulatory system, open circulation, kind of like the mollusks. Uh, but uh, they also have a body cavity, which is sort of a um, precursor to the, the coelom, but that, that's okay. We won't worry about that. Let's see what else. Oh, the respiratory system. We already talked about it. It's the little spiracles. Right? And the holes and tube system, that's more advanced. And it's not gills, it's different than gills. Although some insects are aquatic and in their larval stage, they do have gills. In fact, we even have what you might call the precursor to gills in our embryonic development. But um, a lot of the times the gills are, are redirected by evolution to develop into different structures. And instead they have this tracheal tube system, right? The tracheids. Uh, they also have an excretory system, like uh, similar to the annelids. They don't have kidneys, but they have tubules, right? They were called, I think we talked about this as well, the malpighian tubules. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, and then they have the, um, the life cycle is interesting in that it includes uh, a three-stage life cycle, basically, where you've got the egg, the, egg, the larval stage, and the larval stage and the adult stage, which are often quite different from each other, which is amazing. Like, I don't know if you know this, but a dragonfly, right, which looks like this, it's got a big giant head with two big eyes on it, and it has, you know, four wings that come out of it. We all know what a dragonfly looks like. A dragonfly larva, or sometimes they're called a nymph, it looks like a little under, it lives underwater, it crawls around underwater on, in the sand, and it looks like a little, a little um, dragon from, like it looks like uh, mythical. Let me just show you this, just for a minute. Dragon, fly, nymph. Images. Yeah. So here they are. They don't look like dragonflies at all, do they? They look like, and they're quite large. Like, look at this one. That's what a dragonfly looks like when it's a larva, and it lives in the, in the ocean, or I mean, in the water, underground, under the water, and crawls around in the sand and predate, it's predatory, it eats other things. And then eventually, at some point, it evolves into the dragonfly. Most of the insects that we see, their adult stage is really for only one purpose. It's for mating. So the, the dragonfly, his job or its life is, you know, fly around, eat, eat a few mosquitoes, but find a mate and mate and then die. So it's a very short part of their life cycle. The nymph can live for months and months, whereas the ad adult dragonfly might only live for two weeks. And so we call them insects, and we see them, but all we often see. And, and just, just to make a point, I know you want to break. I don't know if you watch the news, but there's a cicada, which is like a sort of a crickety-like uh, creature. It makes that weird high-pitched buzzing noise you hear outside in the bush sometimes. And they have a weird life cycle. The cicada, some of them, go underground and live in a larval stage, or a pupil stage even, dormant, for like 17 years. And then they hatch, and there's a whole bunch of them that 18th year. And they all run around and they mate, they lay their eggs, and then it's another 17 years before we ever see them again. And this year, there's a 17-year cicada in the eastern United States and parts of Ontario that is going to emerge this year. So keep your eyes peeled and your ears, because you'll hear the the high-pitched buzzing sound of the cicada. And uh, this year, in other words, these creatures were sort of born when you were born, but they've been dormant for 17 years underground, waiting for this moment to come out and mate. Why on earth that life cycle has evolved, we don't really know what the advantages are of it, but obviously there are because it works. So it's pretty cool. The cicada, this seventeen year cicada that's about to about to erupt. Okay, uh, I think that's all we have to say about arthropods, so we'll stop it there, and then we will move into the chordates uh, uh, after our break and finish up.